Hey, sports fans, Larry Eater, run, blog, run, Stuart Weir in lovely Oxford, England, the intellectual capital of the world. You got it. Athletics chat 41, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. 41 weeks, poor Stuart's had a deal with me. It's mm-hmm. been difficult, but, you know, he prays a lot. He's got a good spiritual life, and so I think he can handle anything. Um, hey, Stuart, how are you? Um, well, our gracious leader has addressed us today and has said that we're very good and lucky by July. He might restrict, he might lift some of the restrictions, but don't expect anything to be normal before July, he said. Wow. Yeah, I'm waiting for the uh, Joe Biden to say something similar. I think that uh, he's had a rather rude awakening to what he's inherited in this country right now. And it's... Uh, there was one person, a uh, writer, who put on Twitter today that Boris Johnson has achieved something that few politicians do, that half the country hit him for being too strict in lockdown, and the other half hit him for not being strict enough. <laughs> yeah, I think that's about the same in the U.S. I mean, there's been some rather strange goings on, and I think they're continual to be. I mean, we've had some good track meets. Last week we had the New Balance Indoor, and this week we mm-hmm. had the ATL um, meeting mm-hmm. four. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the the it was a very good meet. Um but I'll tell you the thing that I was impressed most of all is that our our friend Ryan Krauser throwing the shot put twenty one ninety three and puking mm. between each throw. You know, it's just mm. kind of a mm. not the kind of thing that I how I'd want to spend my day. But uh, mm. he's uh, apparently he and his pop mm. got food poisoning on Friday, and uh, he lost fifteen pounds in uh, less than twelve hours. You know, and uh, he, uh, but he's still through. And what's mm-hmm. that like the third farthest throw of the season? I think only Joe Kovacs has been over wow. 22 meters. So, mm-hmm. but you mm-hmm. know, it was good. I mean, it's just, I'm still having trouble, Stuart, getting used to no one being in the stadiums, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, we, we were talking about the, uh, the, the leave and meet, and, and uh, mm-hmm. I interviewed um, Ch- uh, Chase Ely this week and, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She absolutely loved that meet, and she went mm-hmm. to a couple things in Germany too. Mm-hmm. And um, she said, "I said, well, how weird was it not to have fans?" And she goes, "Well, they have all these sounds; they pretend there's fans, and mm-hmm. so you get to the place where you kind of just like focus on what you're yes. doing. So mm-hmm. it's going to be interesting, and and I, I'm mm-hmm. just trying to figure out how they're going to. I mean, one of our announcers over here, Lewis Johnson, who um, was a um, he made his living on the circuit uh, as a pace setter uh, for several years. Um, he does American football announcing and then also athletics over here. Mm-hmm. But he got COVID, and so he was out for a couple mm-hmm. of weeks. Mm-hmm. And um, I've now probably had a dozen athletes I've talked to have had COVID, and it's been tough for almost all of them. You know, it's a little bit scary. But um, our first topic of the the day, I have digressed as always. Um, is Great Britain's golden generation at 800 and 1500. Do you want to start that off for us? Yeah, well, I suppose that when, I mean, the, the quote of the week was Jimmy Webb, okay. who ran faster than Seth Cole's British record, and mm. then said afterwards, you know, I thought I could break the record. I didn't expect to be the second Brit home in the race. So wow. he goes out and breaks that. Um, but Elliot Giles, uh, yeah. Around 143.63. Yeah. Indoor, se- second fastest in history. Um, and then there's Jimmy Webb. Then there's Daniel Rodden, who was the fastest in the summer, uh, but who has not, not um, run indoor. Um, and in fact, he is training in a parking lot. Um, because he's not a funded athlete, he struggles to get access to to the track. But I mean, he says, "Well, it's fine. I just 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 do my work." And then, of course, there's Jake Whiteman, who sprints a bit fifteen hundred, but runs a pretty decent. Um, he's a one forty four eighteen man. Yeah. So you know, you get those four, uh, and then if you move into the fifteen hundred, you got Whiteman, 
you've got uh, Josh Kerr and Neil Gourley, who were selected for the World Championships in Doha. You have Charlie Deval Grice, who did not get selected, and Chris O'Hare, who did not get selected. Yeah. So you've got five. I mean, I know that this happens a lot in the States, but you see, with us, it's pretty rare yeah. to, have, to have five people, um, four and five people in the two events, who, if selected, will reach the final and will be contending for medals. But then, of course, the thing that annoyed uh, Elliot Gile, I actually got a newspaper heading in front of me which said, Elliot Gile says, um, to say that I only break records because of my shoes is an insult. Yeah. Well, I can see that. Um, I, I think that it's, um, you know, our, our friend um, Sean Ingalls, you know, is is pretty directed on this, as are many of the other yeah. athletes. And it started coming up in Doha, if you, as you recall, yeah. because people were asking about shoes. And um, for whatever reason, some people don't seem to think that it's much more complicated than that. Um, mm. We have better tracks now. We have actually much better training in nutrition and sports psychology. Mm. And we have shoes and all those things set up. Yeah. And, and but, to, yeah, to, but, go ahead. No, go on. But I, I was just going to say, you know, um, I think we should go back to running on grass or even possibly cinders yeah. and with everyone wearing tennis shoes. I know? would like that, yeah. I mean, progress. I mean, if you, if you remember the old movie Chariots of Fire about um, Abraham and Little in 24, there's a lot, there's, a bit there where um, Lord Burley complains that some of his competitors are training. Yeah. You know, how unsporting is that? It was, you know, and and that was, was, yep, you're right. You're completely right. And also the, the, the point that, that uh, I mean, uh, Harold Abraham, heaven forbid, had a coach. Yep. Oh, it was, you know, I just, well, I remember is uh, a college student in the 70s. My uni had um, a good cross-country program, and I took it rather mm. seriously. And a couple of my buddies gave me trouble because I was mm. doing two mm. sessions a day. And, mm. you know, they were doing their one, and they felt that was enough. And I said, well, if that's enough for you, that's great. I enjoy what mm. I do. But mm. it's um, Ron Clark said it, you know, the great Australian when he ran, when he broke 28 minutes for the first time, he did it in Turku, Finland on a, mm -hmm. um, I believe it was a, a, a cinder track. And the next, the only way he got the 10,000 on the schedule is he had agreed to come back the next day and run a 3,000 meters. And if anybody's run 25 laps on a track mm -hmm. uh, competitively, when you come back the next day, I remember running a 5,000 the next day. I remember running four mile on the roads. Uh, you, I, I was not a happy camper. Your body was beat up. Um, and he was doing it in long spikes in shoes that are nowhere near the technology now. Do the shoes matter? Of course they do. Um, but there was another piece this weekend that Nike so graciously held off putting out a pair of track spikes because they didn't want to break Usain Bolt's records. Trust me, if a footwear brand could break Usain Bolt's records with their shoe, they would have that shoe out in a second. This is a business. These guys are competitive. They love the sport. Yeah. But mm -hmm. Nike and Adidas and Puma and Brooks and New Balance, if they had a technology they could kick the other's butt, they would put it out there. The only one that's trying to keep some sense with it and – is uh, the world athletics. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Mm -hmm. They're being said, that, you know, it's being said that they're not doing enough. I'm not sure what they can do. Yeah. And, um, our friend Nick Willis said in an article today that these shoes, of course, um, help make you faster. Well, what do they do? Do they bring you up on the ball of your foot? I mean, I remember the in 1980, mm -hmm. there was a shoe called the Air Mariah that Nike did. Mm -hmm. And it was tuned to run at about five-minute pace. 
And when I got to that pace at the 10K, I felt like I was running on clouds. Um, but everything else, slow or whatever, it just, you know, it was okay, but it wasn't great. So mm -hmm. what are the what do these shoes do now? And yes, they obviously do something. The records are falling, but um, I talked to an American coach this weekend about this subject. He thinks that, one, uh, um, athletes are, of course, they're, they're performing well now because they trained so hard last year for mm -hmm. 2020. And he believes that you train two years out from the Olympics and then the year of the Olympics you sharpen and you make sure you don't get yourself hurt. And he mm -hmm. thinks that a lot of these athletes that are doing well now are going to have trouble during an Olympic year or world championship year. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to see how it goes. It, we always were told there's difference between racers and people who could break records. Yeah. We're going to find out, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you, anything that Lord Cole, Sebastian Cole, whose record, whose British record was broken by Elliot Giles, actually said, um, I think it's wrong to say that what we saw last week is simply due to technology. To run that quickly, Elliot Giles deserves praise. Technology has been with us for some time. The challenge we have is to balance not wanting to stifle innovation, but not having shoes that give a clear mechanical advantage. Yeah. Although, interestingly, uh, Giles said he's been wearing the same shoes uh, for a year. Mm. And that uh, and Webb said uh, that he doesn't have the latest uh, Adidas shoes. He's still wow. wearing the same ones he had two years ago. Wow. Um, but uh, it's a problem that we want to say that, um, I mean, it's one of these great things that we love to do. If Roger Bannister were in a race with Nick Willis and with the Kenyans, how would he do? Yeah. And who is the greatest? And I always think that's a, that's a silly thing to debate because mm. how, how do you make it equal for all of them? I mean, Roger Bannister was never a professional athlete. No, no. You know, he he was he would became a a, a world renowned doctor, uh, whereas you know today's athletes are full time and they have all. The advantage, they train full time, they rest, they have the best equipment, they have the best tracks. Uh, again, um, the banister was running on cinders. And perhaps it's because we want to compare times from the past with today. Yeah. Uh, and just if we just accept that, of course, times are going to get faster because, because of, we understand the body better, we know how to train, we're professional. And we have a better a better track, and we have a, a bet, better footwear. It's interesting because at the time that Roger Bannister was running uh, in the European Championships, and I believe in, uh, he was beat by Josef Bartel. Um, mm -hmm. And Bartel was just a better racer than him. Uh, mm -hmm. The thing about Bannister was, you know, he'd run that 402, Pace uh, two years before, and the British Athletics AA didn't accept mm. it. When he mm. ran his sub four minute mile, that was incredible. He built a little mm. treadmill that he could run at six minute pace in his uh, mm -hmm. uh, his house, so he could do his mm -hmm. what thirty minutes to an hour of training a day, and he limited himself mm -hmm. to one hour of training. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was such high quality. But yeah, things things have changed. I mean, look at Arthur Lydiard. You know how crazy people thought he was when he had got guys like Peter Snell doing a hundred miles a week. But yeah, we, the, the, what I'm frustrated about is that many of our media cohorts seem to think it's one thing and it's not. There is a perfect storm right now. There was supposed to be an Olympics last year and people got into incredible shape and some of them have rested and come back and they're running yeah. really well right now. And are they running well, some of them, with really good shoes? But also what people don't seem to be talking about is a lot of the brands are cutting back 
on the athletes that they're supporting. Mm -hmm. So there's people without money. There's people without shoes. So how do you explain all that? And other brands are kind of coming up. So it's a, it's a combined thing. Are the shoes helping? Yes. Do some shoes help more than others? I believe they do. Sean or somebody put out, Oh no, the London mail put out an article this weekend that all the brands will be equal by the time we get to Tokyo. That's a total Mm -hmm. crock. There's brands that are four or five years behind. Um, Can you get some of that technology? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, I I remember when the the breaking two thing happened and I talked to a rival brand of Nikes and I said, Mm -hmm. do you guys have a shoe that can make a guy go under two hours? He goes, sure, if we drop them off a cliff. And we had a good Mm -hmm. chuckle about it. Um, But it's it's a lot of things and, and we're... You know, the um, I still think that the, while the, the breaking two was a magnificent celebration of human uh, support mm-hmm. and everything, it mm-hmm. wasn't a race. No. And it, and it no. never will be a race. Yeah. When I asked yeah. David Bedford, what does mm-hmm. that mean? Mm-hmm. He goes, mm-hmm. Larry, Elliot mm-hmm. Kipchoge is the greatest marathoner in history. Okay, mm-hmm. cool. Mm-hmm. You know, um, yeah. but... You look at guys like Sebco and Ovet and um, um, Steve Cram and McKean and and mm-hmm. some of the other folks out there and the mm-hmm. guys in the generation before that, and they were in a golden age of running in your country. Yeah. And uh, I mean, Ovet could have played American ice hockey too. I mean, the guy knew how to be physical and race as Americans. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Terrible. Mm-hmm. They'd get knocked. I mean, Jim Ryan got knocked down mm-hmm. in the rounds in 1972, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. I, I still think he kind of got jerked around on that mm-hmm. one, mm-hmm. you know. But uh, mm-hmm. so it, it's it's interesting. What are your thoughts on um, how these fancy shoes tie in with uh, the greats in the UK? Well. I think it'll be interesting to see um, how things go in the Olympics. And I think you know this. This is uh, you know I, had to, I was talking to Andy Andy Young a little bit about about this, and mm-hmm. and you know that the way Laura was beaten by um, Tige, um in by several seconds, uh, just how different it is to run a paced race. Uh, to go for a time compared to winning a championship. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you see, um, w- when we get to Tokyo, assuming it happens, and we, we get some of these really technical races, it'll be completely different. Uh, and hopefully, uh, the kind of running in a straight line at a set pace with nobody in front of you. Mm-hmm. Uh, perhaps the advantage of the shoes is much less if you're in in a race where you're covering people in front of you and people behind you. There's no pacemaker, and uh, and you're going fast, you're going slow, you're going fast, you're going slow. So um, that's what I'm looking forward to, and I'm. It's nice to see somebody breaking records, but well, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's being the Olympic champion, being the world champion that, that I think defines athletes. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, I think that uh, I love watching the Diamond League. Yeah. But the reason why the stuff that I love are the Doha championships, all the races lived mm-hmm. up to the hype, the, the European champs, yeah. the Olympics. What I do think is sad, and I don't have an answer to this, is... Um, we have seen some tremendous races performances this year, and half of them are potentially due to drugs, and the other half are, are due to the shoes. Yeah. And it's a shame that we're having these conversations. No, no, I mean, I, that's the. I want to always think that athletes, at the end of the day, if it's athletes who have put the, that extra workout in and the, who have mm. dedicated themselves to, to running mm-hmm. well, 
Yeah. But I also know that this is unfortunately a business and there are athletes who have made the decision that cheating doping mm -hmm. is a, mm -hmm. um, a, a good mm -hmm. business decision because they're not going to get caught. Mm -hmm. And this year with the test dropping by two thirds and mm -hmm. that AIU and WADA and USADA focused on things like guys, people missing whereabouts, which is really yeah. sloppiness and just being yeah. a bonehead. Yeah. I'm yeah. not sure they catch anybody who is a, a cheater, a prolific yeah. doper. I yeah. just yeah. don't think it happens. I think the people they catch are the knuckleheads um, yeah. who don't. These are the same people who can't figure out um, how to get their uh, TiVo working or how to, you know, schedule uh, a, a recording of one of the shows they like when they go out to work yeah. out. They're having, yeah. and, and it's just, and they don't, and no one in their group seems to think that it's important. And that to me is sad. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. if it's an athlete who gets popped for whereabouts, who has a manager in a team should fire mm -hmm. the manager in the team because yeah. at the very least they mm -hmm. should be, if you can't mm -hmm. do it, they should be doing it, you know? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, and the, the shoes, yes, the shoes matter. I really think, quite frankly, the shoes matter a lot more on the roads than they do on the track. Um, mm -hmm. It would make sense to me. I'm just mm -hmm. looking at the midsoles on track spikes, and um, there's things that, that um, there's just things. I'm not sure what the, what the difference is. I will tell you that what I'm reading more and more is the people that are relying on these new training shoes and new racing shoes are having devilish problems with plantar fasciitis, which mm. is what happened back in the 70s and 80s uh, mm. with people going from uh, a little sturdier training shoe to a really light track spike. Mm -hmm. And so we still, we're, we're trading one, problem for another you know so mm -hmm. um talk to me about uh, the gb team for the euro indoors what is going on there well um we've got 41 athletes who have been chosen and we had 48 two years ago but there's a, just a there is a caveat which i'll come to in a moment yeah but I, it looks an exciting team to me you know we've got established stars like andrew posse holly mm -hmm. bradshaw Tiffany Porter, and then we've got Keely Hodkinson, 18, Verity o sorry, Ockenden, Verity uh, Ockenden, 19, Holly Mills, 20, Isabel Buffy, 20, Amelia Quirk, 21, Joe Breyer, 22, and I'm excited about this, and I think you will be too, Jessie Knight has got her first international call-up and she told me tonight, I'm over the moon to be selected for both the individual and the relay. It's my Ooh. first GB vest. I've worked hard for a long time, and I can't wait to get out there. That's awesome. And the other fascinating selection is Jody Williams. Now, no surprise that Jody Williams is in the British team. No. This is the first time she's been selected for the, for the individual 400. Wow. And it's the first indoor team she's made um, since 2012. I mean, to be fair to the selectors, um, for six years, she only ran indoor three times. So if she wanted to be selected for the indoor team, she could have. But that's it. Is it? She's just decided to try running uh, indoor and sure. having to go at the 400. So I'd be fascinated to see that. But now the caveat that I had was that um, because of COVID, um, European athletics have said, rather than setting a rigid standard, we're prepared to look at athletes who don't have the qualifying standard. And some of the British team don't have the qualifying standard um, because they haven't had a chance to run. And so there are, there are possible adjustments. Actually, more could be added 
and some of them could not be accepted. I mean, like Harry uh, uh, um, Igazuriki said this week, you know, he only ran last weekend. He said, you know, this would normally be my fifth race of the year, and it's my first one. Mm -hmm. And uh, because we didn't have championships, we didn't have an indoor championship, but we just had some meets last weekend to give people who hadn't run anywhere else the chance to get the time. It's been a complicated year for selection. But just to make out two events, one positive, one negative, the positive one is in the men's 800, we've got said Elliot Giles and Jimmy Webb and Guy Learmont. And all of those have run at worst an indoor PR this, this year. So there's three form athletes, and that would yeah. be fascinating. But remarkably, we don't have anyone in the 60 meter women's because Dina Asher Smith decided in the end to cut her indoor season. Uh, she was originally targeting it. Asha Phillip has decided she doesn't want to go. And no one, none, I mean, we're talking about the country which has won medals at the last Olympics and the last World Championship in the women's sprint relay, but none of the at least six athletes uh, in that squad uh, want to do the indoor because people are saying, well, um, where I am, how I get to Tokyo, running an indoor championship doesn't help. So uh, surprisingly, wow. we have no one, no one in, in the women's sprint. Wow. In fact, um, we had 10 individual medal winners in Glasgow, and only two of the 12 uh, have decided uh, to go to, uh, to Turin. That's amazing. So it's, it's, it's interesting how people, how people are, are approaching it. You know, people are just saying, well, uh, you know, to get to where I want, want to be, I'm really not sure that running an indoor championship is, is the most helpful thing to do. That's amazing to me. But it'll be interesting to see. I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to the to the event. Um, yeah, I mean the, the only the only two people who won medals in Glasgow are Jimmy Webb mm -hmm. and Holly Holly Bradshaw. You know, you've got um, people like O'Hare, Duckworth, uh, Philip, uh, Courtney Bryant, Selena Austin Clark. Uh, Laura Muir, KGT is injured. Just mm -hmm. all of them, all of them for other than the one injury, have decided um, just not to do the European indoors. But, uh, but to be fair also, um, I think that people may be thinking, do I really want to travel? Because yeah. as I understand it, if you go to Poland for the weekend and you test positive, for COVID, mm -hmm. you have to stay in Poland for 10 days. Oh, wow. So, you know, that, that, that can really, uh, and presumably, pretty much confined to a hotel. So, so now, uh, talk to me about what, what's going to happen with, um, uh, so if the, when the British team goes over, how early will they go over? They're going over um, on the second and the third mm -hmm. in two separate flight flights so they don't all travel together and then the event starts on on the fifth the well the, for some people it starts on the fourth it's basically three full days and a sort of an evening session on the thursday and so some of them will be arriving the day before it starts and some of them will be there two days before it starts how but, will you um, be able to watch it on your sport, or is it on? Um, I think it's on BBC. Okay. Okay. All um, right. But you see, I I chose not to go, or not to try to go. But again, uh, they they said there was a very limited number of. I think there's going to be a maximum of four from Britain. Uh, I haven't actually spoken to anyone about whether they're going. But you know, people were talking today on the call about how media will be told. That if you test positive, you're stuck in Poland for ten days at your own expense. Wow. 
That's pretty amazing. That's really. Um, yeah. And the, the other thing, which, which the way our government's working at the moment, we have this red list. Yeah. And if you, if you have, um, if, if you're coming from a country on the red list, uh, and you know, you could, I could go to Poland, and something happens in Poland, and our government decides that Poland should be on the red list. That would mean when I come back from Poland, I have to spend two weeks in a hotel at Heathrow, paying two and a half thousand dollars for the privilege. Wow! Before I'm allowed to go home. That's crazy. I, mean, I, don't, I don't object to this. I, I mean, 120,000 people have died. So, uh, you know, we got to take it seriously. It, yeah, I just, I mean, we're a half million now, and it's just, I don't know what to, um, it's it just, it's strange to me, and I still hear people saying things like, um, well, you know, you don't really, do you know anybody that's died? Yes, I do. You know anybody that's sick? Yes, I do. And they look at me like I'm strange. And it's just like, you know, and I've gone from between Wisconsin and California. Um, and it's been an absolute uh, zoo, you know. Um, and I don't think it's going to get, I, I like you, I believe it's going to take till midsummer. And that's why I'm yeah. still. You know, I had athletes tell me last week, oh, no, definitely Tokyo's happening. And I'm going, okay. Mm. I don't want to to play with them about that, you know, so. Yeah. Can we just talk about Tokyo for a moment? Because Mm -hmm. I was really interested. I don't know whether you followed at all the Australian Open tennis. which Yeah, tell me about that. I'm curious. Yeah, well, they had 370 players from 100 countries. And they had... They had 130,000 spectators in total, normally about 10,000 10, spectators per day. Mm-hmm. But the, the director of the tournament, Craig Tilly, said um, that compared to what they had done to make their tournament work, um, he's not really convinced by Tokyo. I mean, like, for example, they chartered 17 jumbo jets to fly wow. players in. They had quarantine accommodation for 1,300 people. And they, the tournament would run at a loss of $70 million because of everything they had done. That you know, even in, in, the, in the venue, they had zones for spectators so that you, know, you couldn't get from one zone to the other. Mm-hmm. And if you wanted food during it, they had a click and collect system. You didn't have to stand in line because they didn't want you standing close to anyone. So wow. you would presumably call on your phone for your burger and fries. You'd get pinged when it was ready and you'd go and collect it. But, but what he said was that, um, that what they had done was they had required players for the two weeks before the tournament to stay in their hotel rooms 19 hours and they were allowed out to practice for up to five hours okay um but uh, there were 72 players who had to stay in 24 hours a day because they had been in close contact with someone who tested positive wow and and i mean this is what he said i've seen the playbook for the olympics i've looked at it carefully compared to what we've done we had a far more rigorous program than what was proposed by Tokyo. He says, I love the Olympics. I'd love to see it be successful. But yes. based on the experience we've had, I cannot see it working the way they're trying to do it. Well, it, just think about the organization in London in 2012. Mm. Um, I never told this story before but uh, early in the olympics i wanted to take a shortcut i was trying to find a bus and i was by myself and i found a hole in one of the fences and i walked through it and within a couple minutes there was a light shining on me and 
two soldiers with very big guns. And they looked at me and they mm -hmm. said, you're a, an American. I said, yes, sir, I am. And they said, what the bloody something are you doing here? And I said, oh, I found this little shortcut. I'm trying to get to the bus there. And they started laughing and they said, you will not use this again. And I said, okay, so I can't use it now. And they laughed and they said, no, you got to go back out. Okay. When we were in Rio, the, um, I mean, there were patrols everywhere. And mm -hmm. this was just because they were worried about crime and stuff. Yeah. How are they going to control things in Tokyo? How are they going to tell people not to get together? How are mm -hmm. they going to tell people? I mean, how many times did you see, you know, a group of rowdy um, fans just enjoying mm -hmm. themselves and drinking a lot of beer? You think they're really going to yeah. stop that stuff? I, I just well, don't know mm -hmm. how they're going to do it. Well, I just don't know whether they're, I mean, this is, we don't know whether there are going to be any spectators. Yeah, yeah. No, that's true. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the comment yeah. that everybody said to me so far. Yeah who's been privy to various things. And then what the, the update yeah. on the Olympic booklet just said mm. was no spectators. And, you know, it's, mm. uh, I want the athletes to be able to compete, but I want them to be able to do it safely. I just yeah. get this terrible feeling that we're not going to have a, it's going to come back big. We're going to get the Commonwealth, the Europeans and the world champs mm. all in one year. Mm. We probably yeah. won't, we, we may not see us in, in, how does uh, how many people are going to go to an Olympics in China in 2022? And mm -hmm. I, I I don't want to cast any aspersions on China, mm -hmm. but I think mm -hmm. that it's just uh, mm -hmm. um, it's scary right now. People are still mm -hmm. afraid. Mm -hmm. Have you bought your ticket yet for the World Indoors in China? Uh, no, I haven't. Yes, yeah. I mean, it was uh, yeah. I asked my son if he wanted to go, and he looked at me and gave me one of those looks only Adam can do when it's like, dad, what did I say in 2008 and 2015? Okay. Mm. I mean, I love China. I had so much fun. Mm. The people were lovely. Mm. I would, mm. I mean, I have a, this picture of me near a tank with three soldiers with one of my Wisconsin shirts on and mm. the kids were great. Mm. And they were, you know, <laughs> they were kids. Mm. And, 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 and um, it mm. was interesting. And I remember, hiking up the um, Great Wall and this mm -hmm. Chinese kid coming up to me seeing that I was an American and saying, do you know Kobe Bryant? And that's when I started to crack up going, you know, the universality of sport. And mm. I think that's one of the things that you and I get struck by every mm -hmm. day. I mean, you've been, mm -hmm. we've been fortunate. We've had a great little yeah. indoor season. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So what do we got coming mm -hmm. this week? What what meets do we have? Uh, Madrid. Madrid, and that's on when? Is that tomorrow? That's on Wednesday. Wednesday, okay. And that's the last one before tow yeah. room, correct? It is, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. Did you get to watch the New Balance indoor? Um, yeah, I did, yeah. What did you BBC think of it? Had that one. Yeah, no, there were some good, there were some, some, some good events there. What was your yeah. favorite meet so far this season? Well, probably say Neva, but then it was also the one that made me most sad because I went to that last year and I yeah. wish I was there this year. Yeah. But I, um, I think we've seen an awful lot of good action, and uh, I've managed not to write a word about shoes um, so far, so I try to take it at, at, at face value. Um, uh, I think there have been some exciting British performances, but we all know that winning uh, an indoor event is a long way from winning an Olympic medal. Uh, yeah. But, you know, there's the athletes, you can only beat two whoever's in the race. So I think that it's been good to see some of our, our athletes out. Um, I, I mean, I do think the other thing about the, about the Olympics that, that is going to be different this year is it will be far from a level playing field in terms of the preparation people have had. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you're, I think you're right. And with that, dear friend, we will be closing down athletics chat 41. Uh, this is Stuart mm -hmm. Weir in Oxford, England, the intellectual mm -hmm. capital of the world. 
I'm Larry Eater. I'm in the cheese capital of the world, Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. We bid you adieu. Uh, and uh, thank you for supporting Run Blog Run. If you like us, like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you love us, uh, subscribe on the YouTube and make sure you read Stuart's articles. They're fun. And we have a lot of fun doing stuff on Twitter. So please check us out with our cool pictures and our pithy comments. Stuart, thank you very much, my friend. Stay safe. Okay. Thank you. Talk to you Good next night. week. Yeah. Cheers. Hey, sports fans, Larry Eater, Athletics Chat 41. This is the epilogue. You know the deal. It's where I speak incessantly, and Michael tells me three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. Dear God, please stop the horror. Anyway, um, this is the epilogue for Athletics Chat 41. What were our topics today? We had some fascinating topics. Um, we uh, started out talking about, again, how great the season's been, which has been fantastic. Um, and Stuart talks about the um, his favorite meat's been living. Mine has been uh, the New Balance meat. I mean, I really love the American Track League stuff, but the New Balance meat still um, does a lot. And watch my deep thoughts and writings this week on the on the New Balance meat and why I liked it. Anyway, Stuart talked about the Golden Generation, but he he brought up that. Uh, Elliot Giles, you know, new world leader, uh, broke the British record in the 800. And uh, uh, so did Jamie Webb. But Jamie was second to break Sebco's record. And um, you've got uh, um, some incredible athletes in the UK in the 1500 as well. Five people under really 331. And how are they going to pick them? And... Uh, Stuart and I chatted a little bit about Seb Coe and Steve Cram and Steve Ovet and Tom McKean and that generation. And we also talked a little bit about uh, the uh, need for media right now to say, well, it's all about the brand new shoes. Uh, I think that's really, I think the shoes have something to do with it. But as um, uh, as Elliot Giles just said, it's not all about the shoes. It's the perfect storm. You have athletes who were in incredible shape for 2020, and they rested a big part of 2020. Now they're blowing the sport apart in 2021. Elliot Giles, in fact, isn't in one of the new pair of Nike shoes, and neither is Lee Webb in the new pair of Adidas shoes. So what's going on there? Why are these guys running faster? Do the shoes matter? Yes, they do, as do the new Mondo tracks, as do proper nutrition, sports psychology, rest, training, everything, the level of athleticism too, it all matters. Um, Sean Engels wrote a very good piece today about the benefit of the shoes and his incredulity that uh, athletes don't want to talk about it. Well, He's got to look no farther than himself because I believe that a lot of the media, and they've been doing this since Doha, everything's about the shoes or everything's about Christian Coleman. It's much more complicated. Everybody wants one little answer, a black and white answer, and it's not that. When Ron Clark broke uh, 28 minutes for the first time in Turku, Finland, I think it was 1966, he did it on a cinder track. The way he got the race on the schedule is he had a promise to meet directors that he would come back the next day after having raced 25 laps in long spikes on cinders. Your legs have to feel like absolute crap. And he had to run a 3,000 against the big guns, okay? So he his track, if he had been running on an artificial track, how much faster would he have gone? I believe he said one time he thought he could run in the 27... 20s, you know, um, and I believe he probably could have too. Um, I, I think that the quality of shoes, the quality of tracks, the quality of training, the qual all these things add up. The shoes have pushed it too far. The, the shoes on the track, yes, they're a benefit. Some people have said one, one and a half percent. Um, but I think where they're really making a huge difference is in the marathon distance. I remember talking to uh, a former world record holder who told me that um, 
they believe what the shoes do on the roads is that they help keep fatigue under control so that your legs aren't all beat up between 20 and 26 and you can still move. And that's a huge, huge thing over a marathon. If you've ever experienced that, I did 18 of them. It took me 11 to figure out actually how to run them right, but you know, not blowing up every time. Um, it, it's, it's the new shoes provide a conundrum, but the companies are not equal. There is no way the London daily mail put an article up that by the Olympics, you know, 10 or 11 brand, brands will have the same shoes as Nike. Good try. Good luck. What Nike and Adidas and Puma and Brooks and New Balance have done, they've done some pretty incredible shoe cobbling. And it's much more than that. It's technology. It's who owns the technology, who has the trademarks on the midsoles, what this stuff's made of, how it works, what's the resiliency, what's the energy return. Uh, You almost need a physics degree to understand it. But does it help? Yes. But you cannot take someone who's running a five-minute mile and expect they're going to break the world record for the mile. It's silliness, okay? And that's what we're trying to get at, too. Um, And I think some of our cohorts have just taken it a little too seriously. The GB team for indoors, uh, they're going to have 41 athletes on it. Typically, they have about 48. Some younger athletes, too, so that'll be kind of fun. Um, but there's still some juggling to do with getting the tow room. I just filled my application out to remotely cover the uh, European Indoor Champs. I love the European Indoors. One of my favorite events, but I can't get to Poland. You know, I'm just the wee American. Um, what the Olympics can learn from the Australian Open. Australian Open had about 1,300 people they had to process. They had to watch out. Um and um, so, and so, what happened was this: was that in looking at the thirteen hundred people that they put together, they have uh, the, some of the people that have been involved said there's no way Tokyo can happen. We'll have to keep that in our next discussion. Uh, thank you for watching um, the epilogue to the Athletics Chat Forty One. This is Larry Eater with Run Blog Run. If you like Run Blog Run, like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you love us, love us on the YouTube. Take care.